picked up on the, the progression in some of the songs that we've been singing. And, um, you know, some have asked me when I'm going to get back to expository preaching. It's coming. Um, but part of the reason that I've taken this time, this hiatus, if you will, to talk about history a little bit and some of our heritage is because we all stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before us. This culture at this time in 21st century is so myopic. We are so caught up in the present. And I read a book years and years ago called Future Shock. It wasn't a Christian book. It was a futurist book, kind of sociology and everything. And it said that technology is moving at such a rate that eventually people are going to be completely self-contained for their own sanity's sake. They're not going to be able to keep up with everything. And older people who can't keep up with the technological changes will basically just shut down. They'll kind of unplug and be on the side of things. I think we might be there. Um, we're pretty absorbed in our little devices. And I, I still am thinking about having device-free days where you sign up and you commit to just being device-free for one day and we'll all pray for you and see if you can do it. But the problem is, is that by being so present, so here now, we have a tendency to forget what has gone on before and how we got to where we are. Like this morning, why are you in church? <laughs> Not a hard question. Why are you here? What is church to you? Do you know that there have been centuries and centuries, millennia actually, of development that has brought us to this point? And that is part of the reason why I did this series on the five pillars of the Reformation. Beginning with sola scriptura, the formal principle from which all the others flow, the scripture alone, solus Christus, sola fide, sola gratia, soli deo gloria. The Reformers did a huge theological reset. Luther didn't even know what he was doing, actually, to be honest with you. He had no idea. He was just living his Christian life out, and God revealed more and more to him, and, and he was obedient to that which God revealed to him, and bam, you've got the Reformation. There was a return to the truth of the Scriptures, which led to the realization that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and it's all to the glory of God. They didn't even formulate that at that time. They did each of the individual little pieces. We kind of look back at this and we say, this is what took place. And we come up with the five sola. And within 10 years of Luther nailing the 95 Theses on the doors in Wittenberg, it became evident that not all were on the same page. <laughs> and so I want to talk to you this morning about the Anabaptists and their focus on the church. Next week I'll be talking about the Puritans and their focus on the soul. They were referred to as doctors of the soul. And this follows suit with what I've been teaching thus far in the five sola because the Reformation and Protestantism had refinements as it went forward. And so you see, even not more than 10 years into the Reformation, Luther and the magisterial reformers, you have these characters called the radical reformers or the Anabaptists. And they're refining what the reformers did. And as somebody said, they reformed the reformers, or tried to. Okay? And then you move into how that Reformation theology moved over into, uh, from Germany and Austria and these, these countries, over into England. And you had a Reformation of the Church of England called the Anglican Church. And yet there was a further refinement of the Anglican Church by the Puritans. This is so interesting. And from the Puritans, let's just leapfrog to us. Because a lot of those guys came over to the New World, escaping religious persecution. 
And so our heritage is all wrapped up in this. And I don't want us to be myopic. I don't want us to be uh, just oblivious to where we have come from. We are standing on the shoulders of great men and much heresy. <laughs> much heresy. Every one of these groups, there were problems that they had. That's why they needed further refinement. And truth be told, the evangelical church in the United States of America right now is in deep need of refinement. Deep need of refinement. So, let's just begin by a word of prayer and ask God's blessing upon this history lesson. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for all the dear brothers and sisters through the history from the foundation of the church at Pentecost who gave their blood for the truths that they understood your scriptures to teach. Father, may we never think lightly of the two ordinances of baptism and the Lord's table when we participate in them or watch others being baptized. May we recognize that many, many, many thousands of people died for those doctrines that we take for granted these days. And Father, may we be uh, refreshed anew with some of these truths and listening to the stories of men and women that stood strong on the truth of your word and were willing to die for these truths. And yet, how even some of those could have used more refinement in their theology. And let us humble ourselves before you in your mighty hand and recognize that we are but people and you are God. And we may have areas that we need refinement in. Help us to be open and sensitive to your spirit through your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so beginning not more than 10 years after the 95 Theses, at, which was in 1517, something developed called the Second Front. Second Front because the first front was the Magisterial Reformers. No name is really carried on the banner of the Second Front, as it's called. No one item that identified that cause, except maybe baptism, but that was really a misnomer, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But in 1525, Zwingli, who was a Swiss magisterial reformer, Zwingli stated, quote, the struggle with the Catholic party was but child's play when compared with the struggle erupting on the second front. Because that's where it really came alive. It wasn't in Germany, it was in Switzerland, it was in Zurich, where Zwingli was. And uh, in 1525, there are some interesting things that took place there in Zurich. Other names for the movement of the Second Front are the stepchildren of the Reformers. I like that one. The stepchildren of the Reformers. The radical Reformers, because they, they went towards militancy. At first they were pacifists, and then they went towards militancy, and then they kind of petered out of the way because that was wrong. The Anabaptists is one that you would be familiar with, the Anabaptists. And the Anabaptists, and I, I want to just link them with just the one element that got them the name, the Anabaptists, and that's because they did not accept the Reformed christening of children, or the Catholic, Pado baptists They went against that, and they believed in believer's baptism, and I'll get more into that when we get there. But all the names given by the reformers to these outgroup people were derogatory. Yet they refer to the same movement of reformer refinement of the reformers promoted by the group, which although they started out as friends with Zwingli and with some of the reformers, in the end they separated from them and then became persecuted not only by the Catholic Church who was already persecuting them, because they existed before the 95 Theses, but now by the Reformers themselves. And so they couldn't win for losing. But they brought to the church of Jesus Christ, the real church, okay, that's in every age, they brought to the church a real refinement of which we are celebrating amongst ourselves even today. And so I want to talk about these things. And let me say at the outset that I'm not promoting the Anabaptists as a model of theological preciseness. Don't go and say, 
Pastor Steve said we're Anabaptists. You know, you guys are constantly trying to put us into a, into a box. Don't do that. Here's, if, this is the only box I want to be in. Okay, so put us in this box. But people are saying, are we Calvinists? No. Calvinists would not like my theology, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Are we Reformed, Pastor? No. The answer to all these things is yes and no. But it's kind of like we, we take the meat and spit out the bones because I have a responsibility as a pastor to say, thus saith the word of God and bring the word of God to you, not some system of theology that has been put together. I, I won't do that to you. So I try to stay true to the word of God and, and not be in error. So as we go along, we're going to see some interesting things that, that these people brought, uh, but they also had a lot of bones. And I'll talk about some of those bones, too, because I think they're very interesting. There are a lot of problems. Some were already present when they were still friends with the Reformers amongst these stepchildren, but others developed and became glaring later on in their history. And what I want to address is the way in which their theology brought a further refinement of the magisterial Reformers who retained much of their Catholic background and brought that baggage with them into the Reformed state congregations that they established. Are you tracking with me? They did pull away from the Catholic Church. That was never their initial intent. Their initial intent was to remain within the Catholic Church because in their mindset, the Catholic Church was the church, but it had become, uh, co become corrupted and so they wanted to reform the church. But it became more and more clear, as the Pope said, kill these people, <laughs> that they weren't going to be able to reform from within. And so they began to start up these reform congregations. I was able to be in the first church that um, they did what they called the German Mass. And that was Luther. And that was in Wittenberg. And the German Mass included singing, Public singing, which wasn't done at that time. There was chanting, but not singing. Public singing. And they celebrated the Lord's table with both elements, which was just like radical beyond measure at that time. But those churches were actually state churches. They were still linked with the magistrates, hence the magisterial reformers, their title. Now, Though the Anabaptist movement seemed to have gone to seed and become very entangled in theological excesses, both in church function and their views on the end times, they had some really, really horrendous perspectives on prophecy. Their identification of very important biblical principles about the church. That's why we sang what we sang today. And thank you, Tracy, for choosing out such hymns about the church are still important today. And I'm going to identify those things. So let's just look at two vital elements that lead us from the Reformers to the stepchildren. The view of the church, whether it's separate or whether it's joined to the state. And secondly, church function, is it or will it be dictated by the Bible or will it be dictated by traditions? Okay. So what's in a name under church, church and state? Church or church and state, what's in a name? The Anabaptists was a name given to free churchmen that remained unencumbered by the Catholic Church of the Middle Ages. Okay. They're so-called because the title literally means to re-baptize, but they refused that title because they said, we are not re-baptizing these people. They were never baptized to begin with because they didn't believe in infant baptism. They believed that baptism, not a sacrament, but an ordinance left by Jesus Christ, was a public confession of the spiritual transformation that took place when they converted and were regenerate. And so faith preceded baptism. Infants are incapable of repenting and believing. And that was their, their big call, and they stood on it. And so, therefore, they were called rebaptizers. 
And the Anabaptists instead referred to themselves, now get this, they called themselves brethren. They called themselves Christians. And they called themselves believers. They said, don't call us Anabaptists. We're brethren. Don't call us Anabaptists. We're, we're believers. Don't call us Anabaptists. We're, we're Christians. Now, in a bit, I'm going to give you a history that goes all the way back to just after the first century and Christianity or the church, okay? Because these outgroups continued on through the Middle Ages, through the Dark Ages. They continued to function and meet in small groupings outside the church. The Roman church called them heathen. The Roman church called them heretics. But they didn't believe in paedo baptism. They didn't believe in the church hierarchy that developed around the 500s. Well, began in 300, but went on. The popes were really strong in the 500s. Didn't believe the church should be mixed up with the civil magistrates. And they were like that all the way through. So they were already in place, all these little groups, disparate though they were, and just afflicted with heresy. There were all sorts of aberrant things going on in these groups, but they had some things really, really solid. And that's what I want to bring to you today. Now, the magisterial reformers, especially Luther and Zwingli, promoted, uh, promoted a state and church combination. What much of the division came from with Anabaptists is the idea of the church itself. What is the church? Okay. In fact, very little magisterial... Uh, the very title magisterial goes back to magistrates or the princes. Remember, Luther had a guy that watched out for him. He was in the civil government and he watched out for him. One time kidnapping him when he was condemned to die by the Pope. He kidnapped him and put him away in a castle, remember? And he became Junker George. And remember that story? That was a prince. That was a civil authority that came around and helped him. Well, many of these civil authorities then jumped on the Reformation bandwagon. Were they saved? I doubt many of them were. But that's where the civil grouping comes in, and the church and the state were just intertwined in these Reformed congregations, and it wasn't good. Both Luther and Zwingli were men of the Catholic Church originally, and with Luther being a priest. And their views of the church focused more on the spiritual aspect of the church, a universal church, and they believed in what is called Christendom. Okay, and the way you get into Christendom is being baptized as a baby. And there were Christian countries, and there were heathen countries. So you got a whole mindset, okay? And the worldview at that time was, you are either in the Catholic church and in Christendom, or you are not, and you're a heathen, and you're on the outside. Both Luther and Zwingli both admitted and taught that the visible church on earth would be peopled with tares as well as wheat. And they both saw the church represented on earth by territorial or state churches with their leading church in Rome as the head. The reform that they sought didn't include separating from Rome, like I said. Not at all. They wanted to reform it from within. And their thinking was caused... It, it caused the Anabaptists, who were at first quite enthused with the work that Luther and later Zwingli promoted, but as time went on, they saw the tenacity with which both of those men held to that state church mentality. You see, when Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the door and, you know, those sola that we've kind of distilled it all down into, when these brethren, when these Christian, when these believers, these outgroup people who were meeting in small assemblies anyway, way all over Europe, when they heard that, they went, hallelujah, it's finally coming to fruition. We're returning to the truth. <laughs> Until they dug a little bit deeper, and it was within 10 years that they discovered, uh -huh, this is like corrupt as corrupt can be too. Why do I say that? Well, it's interesting what some of these men had to say about the church. So let me give you just a little pre-Reformation history of this remnant of God's true worshipers. There's always been a believing remnant. 
During the late 100s and throughout the 200s, there were intense persecutions of the Christians. And it scattered them all over the Roman Empire. In the mid-third, there began to be more hierarchical structure with the church, and Rome became preeminent. And yet the persecution continued. But in 312 A.D., 312, 300 A.D., right? 100 is the time of the first New Testament church functioning and everything. By 300, 312 A.D., a guy by the name of Constantine, Constantinople, Constantine, he got converted, supposedly. He saw a vision of a cross in a battle, and boom, he's a Christian. It's, you know, disputed. Was he really a Christian, or did he just decide, this is a political advantage if I gather all the Christians together and stop the persecution? So with the conversion of Constantine, the state became linked with the church for the first time. As Constantine was preparing to do battle, he saw that cross, and boom. Now he won, and he became emperor of the Western Roman Empire, And in 313, the next year after his quote-unquote conversion, together with the emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire, they got together and they signed the Edict of Milan, which ensured tolerance for Christians, which stopped the persecutions, which were horrific persecutions. Thousands upon thousands of Christians died. But Constantine, because he was now the emperor and a Christian, Stop the persecutions. And I'm sure the Christians went, hallelujah, here we are. Corruption. By the 500s, the popes are like presidents or or kings now. And they're reigning over the dark ages. And the church is firmly wed with the state. The uh, medieval church had begun in Throughout the dark ages, there were still this group of faithful remnant of God's people gathering for worship. And even though it was a consistent testimony of the church for the first 400 years of their existence that these outgroups did not do infant baptism, in fact, even the Catholic Church practiced baptism by immersion. In 401 AD, the reigning Roman Church began teaching and practicing infant baptism. 400 A.D., people. Okay. Now, the long-standing dissenting churches first opposed the Roman hierarchical structure of the church, continued to resist in the area of baptism and baptize those who made professions of faith and suffered for it. They were autonomous and existed throughout the empire. I just want to call them free churches, okay? They are just free churches. They weren't beholden to Rome. You can study their roots by looking up their various names. The Donatists. The Donatists were an interesting group because during those persecutions, there were elders in the churches that that, that, that buckled because of persecution. And they, they gave up the faith, so to speak. They decided to deny Christ. After the persecution was put down, they repented. Can you, get the, can, you, can you see this happening? They repented, and they want to come back and be leaders in the church again. The Donatists said, absolutely not. There is no way. They're traitors. They can't be leaders of our churches. And that's the Donatist movement. They were faithful people. Well, they had some problems. One of the things I learned in my research this week is that all these groups, the Donatists, and you've got the Paul. Uh, Oh, gosh, there's just a whole range of them. That you got to be careful when you're reading about them to understand where the source material is coming from because the scholars at that time were all Catholic. And so the history of what these people actually believed, but didn't believe probably, was all through the bias of a church that thought they were heretics. But some of these held to very, very strong biblical truths. So you can look at the Donatists and the Waldenses, and within these groups there was a wide range of theological differences, and some of it was not strictly orthodox. So don't go following any of these groups, but take the meat and throw out the bones. When the Reformation was consolidated by Luther's 95 Theses, 
the groups rallied around the reformers. It was these free congregations built around biblical doctrine and not a denomination or territories within various countries. And the Anabaptists, first corporately identified in Zurich, came into the picture. In 1525, okay, 1517 is when he nailed the thesis to the door. 1525, after discovering that Zwingli would not follow their influence and reforms, the Second Front denounced the tradition of christening and separated from the established Roman Catholic Church and the Reformers. They broke away, and on January 21st, 1525, a former priest, you might want to knock this down if you're interested in history, George Blorock, requested Conrad Grebel to baptize him in the city, city square, in the fountain right in the middle of Zurich. That is in your face, people. Okay? I'm coming to think that the people of this time were all fighters. Everybody. It's like, gosh, they just, they, they just were adamantly, when they believed something, they went to the stake for it. A little bit different than our tolerant society, isn't it? So Conrad baptized George in the fountain. And it showed that infant baptism is invalid and solidified the derogatory name of Anabaptists, rebaptizers from that point on. The Catholic areas in Switzerland were already condemning the radical reformers, the Anabaptists, to death in 1525. Catholics already hated them because they were an outgroup that they recognized a long time ago. The following year, the council government of Zurich, of which Zwingli was a part, followed suit. On January 5th, 1526 now, it's the next year, Felix Mance became the first Anabaptist martyr in Zurich. So now these faithful people, faithful to the scripture, are being persecuted by the Catholic Church and the magisterial reformers to the point of dying. They tied his feet, tied his hands behind his back and put a big pole between them and then he was drowned in Lake Zurich. His last words were into thy hands, O God, I commend my spirit. By 1528, King Charles V ordered all the radicals be put to death. And in 1529, the same Lutheran princes in Germany who were first called the Protestants convened and approved Charles' decree. This makes me want to weep, people. Why do we devour our own? We're still doing it today. Been on Facebook lately? Been reading any of the blogs where one Christian is just pitted against another Christian with such vitriol? And you know that they're both believers. I know some of these men. And they just, what kind of testimony is that? The world will know that we are Christians by our love to one another. Well, it was these Anabaptists that took Luther and the magisterial reformers to task for not carrying the Reformation far enough. And at first, the friends of the reformers, later they became their biggest critics and came to be called the second front of the Reformation. Now, even though the Reformational Anabaptists began in Zurich, it quickly spread to Moravia, throughout Germany, Austria, and a lot of these other countries, Holland, and Anabaptists were persecuted in Roman by both Roman Catholics, other Protestant groups, and most sadly, most of the Anabaptist leaders were executed by the end of the 16th century. So it was a group that started up and then kind of petered out. And even though one of the hallmarks of the early radical reformers was pacifism, which it was, Quaker, think Quakers, offshoot of the Anabaptists. The ongoing persecution eventually resulted in armed resistance. They had enough of it. Imagine the children of the original followers said, phooey on this, man, they're killing us. And they took up arms. So much so that King Ferdinand of Austria declared drowning the best antidote to Anabaptism. He called it the third baptism. 
lovely people, these. By 1532, the militant Anabaptists became famous in their mass revolt now called the Munster Rebellion, Munster, Germany. They took over the town of Munster. They baptized over 1,000 people, adults, in Munster. And there was a leader that became very, very, uh, he must have been very charismatic, he was very strong. And he called Munster the New Jerusalem. And he referred to himself as a second Gideon. Okay? You can see the hubris, the pride. And as he gained authority and much more authority, he fashioned himself to actually be the uh, successor to King David, who's an Anabaptist man. (laughs) And he attempted to assume absolute authority in the new Zion. This group practiced polygamy, and he had 16 wives, along with true New Testament church principles, except they forgot that part about committing adultery. (laughs) Right? Needless to say, the movement went to seed. When the city was finally besieged and regained by the authorities, the Anabaptist perpetrators were captured, tortured, and executed. Their bodies were hung from the steeple at St. Lambert's Church. You've got to visit Europe, okay? Because though the bones are gone, the cages remain in the steeple at St. Lambert's Church. Just a reminder. In northern Germany and Netherlands, pacifist uh, Anabaptists rallied the leadership of Menno Simmons, and he survived the persecution, and Menno's followers would eventually form a group called the Mennonites. Modern offshoots of the Anabaptists include the Amish, the Brethren, the Hutterites, and all of which have a very complex and interesting theological history. All are aberrant on one level or another. But all of them tried to stay close to the Scripture, and they were on the outs with the Reformed state churches and on the outs with the Catholic Church. For that alone, we can say, yay. The other stuff, sad, sad histories. Now, here's the problem. Should the Churches be territorial and state churches, or should they be independent, autonomous churches? You see, folks, we we face that today. Now, we are loosely affiliated with an organization called Converge, and I love Converge. They've helped us a lot. But we are not a full-fledged member of the Converge denomination. That's the Baptist General Conference. used to be Baptist. And I don't know where I stand on that because... On the one hand, there's really a lot of good things in joining in with a group. On the other hand, it's like, nah, I don't want to be beholden to a group that tells us what we should or should not do as a church, possibly. I'm very, very much a free churchman, very much. Not evangelical free church, free church, as opposed to state church or denominationalized. And I think if you wanted to say anything to anybody, say, we're a free church. We're a Bible church. We're a free church. Not evangelical free church, just free church. And that would be more accurate. So if you're looking for a nomenclature to refer to us by, I think that would be safe to say. We're a free church. The second front were free churchmen, which not only remained separate from the regime of the medieval church, but also rejected the reformers, right? But the Second Front promoted the idea of local assemblies made up of regenerate believers who are baptized as adults and which churches cannot and should not be related to the civil authorities. That's why I'm telling you this history. We stand on their shoulders. We don't want the government coming into our church, right? I mean, we're Americans anyways. Don't tread on me. We don't want the government coming into anything. Anabaptists insisted on the contrast between church and civil society. It rejected the structures of power of society from being transferred to the church because that's exactly what happens. And even though Luther's original goals did not intend it, Lutheranism was now supported by the princes who embraced it, and such princes enjoyed great authority in matters both civil and church. How did such a thing ever come to be? For the New Testament doesn't show the church 
to be wedded to civil society. It started way back in 312 with Constantine. And it just kept building and building and building. Now, when I go over to Germany and I teach the church planning seminars that I teach, I have men that grew up in the state church because the state church is still very much alive over in Europe, especially in Germany. And what the ch uh, state church does is the pastor, if I was a pastor of a state church, the state pays my salary, gives me a great pension, and everything's good, right? But they also have a lot of control over me. And so when I'm teaching these young men who want to plant churches, I'm promoting them to plant free churches. So I'm not a friend of the state church. They probably would not like me very much if they knew I was doing anything, but I'm just small potatoes. It's okay. But don't despise the day of small beginnings. Jesus started with 12 men, right? So we might want to see a whole movement of free churches being planted in Europe. That's what our, our goal is in our prayer. So we move from 312, the Roman hierarchical structure coming in. By 500, you got popes that are stronger than anything. The merging state with the church in policy and function. By Luther's day, the Pope supreme and demanding that people be killed. And the worldview of that day was Christendom was the Catholic Church. There was nothing outside the Catholic Church that was Christian in their mindset. Take the free church now. The Anabits, the Anabaptists, the stepchildren of the Reformers come into play. They took the principles of the New Testament from the early days of the church and they were a remnant in practicing those truths. They were afflicted by heresy, like I mentioned, but the groups continued to follow. Here's a list of some of their names. Polyseans, Polyseans, you can look that name up if you want to. Um, Cathari, that's where we get our word Carthacist. Uh, they were like the first Puritans because they were called the pure. The Bogomils and the United Brethren, that was more in uh, Germany and Austria. And then you had the Swiss Brethren. Some of these groups are still alive and well today. My whole mission, uh, New Tribes Mission, has a strong brethren, Plymouth brethren background because they came over from England and they started up their group there. Now, one of the things all these groups rejected was pedo-baptism, baptizing babies, sacraments, they believed in ordinances, not sacraments, Ecclesiastical hierarchy comes from the Bible, not from outside sources. They refuse to worship icons. And listen, Zwingli, really. Uh, my wife was sharing this with me from her art history days. He destroyed many of the beautiful Renaissance works of arts. Um, beautiful paintings and so forth that were done coming up through the centuries that were part of the Roman church. He destroyed them in their wanting to take down icons. Emphasized salvation by grace through faith and so forth. So these groups had some things that were really in place. But when they started telling the reformers they had to separate from the Roman church and the structure so firmly established and linked to the state, they were anathema. Now this is where I really want to talk to you today because we delve into the scripture a little bit more than history. Church function or Bible tradition. This is where it really applies to us today and how we operate. You see, the Reformers viewed the church in continuity with the Old Testament and Israel. But the Anabaptists viewed the church in a discontinuity way, that there was a new vibrant entity born on the day of Pentecost called the church, and all that were part of the church are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. This is a huge break in the thinking of the people at that time, and that's what Paul had all sorts of problems with. You can read about this in Acts 2, 1 through 21, and Acts 2, 38 through 47, where we get our five pillars for our church from, Acts 38 through 47, Acts 2, 38 through 47. The church... I'm going to tell you, is not the new Israel people. 
It is a separate entity. It is not Israel. But rather, it's a separate entity referred to as a mystery in the New Testament. Turn to Ephesians chapter 3. And let, let me just read you a few verses. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God and his grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. Now, if it was made known to him the mystery, then that means the mystery has been opened up and revealed. It's no longer a mystery. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. There it's a little bit further identified. Which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, like other generations like the Old Testament. Okay? As it has now been revealed, so he's saying, the mystery has been revealed to me by God himself, to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. And now he gets very specific, and he says right here, to be specific, that the mystery is the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body. That means that the Jews no longer have the corner on things. There's something new that has taken place, and it's Jew and Gentile together, i.e., the church, the body of Jesus Christ, begun at Pentecost. And they're fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I have been made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the ministry for ages has been hidden in God who created all things so that the manifold wisdom of God might be now made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh my gosh, does that harken back to something I was talking about last week? That eternal purpose before the ages, before the foundation of the world, that there was a plan in place in the mind of God and a special gift prepared for his beloved son, the love gift that he prepared before the foundation of the world, which is the church? Yes, that's exactly what this is talking about. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Therefore I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are to your glory. So Paul's explaining to the Ephesians this new entity, the church. And he's saying it was once a mystery in the Old Testament. They didn't know anything about this, but now it has been revealed, and it's Jew and Gentile together. It's a beautiful truth. So I think their influence, though unheeded by the reformers, we need to identify at least five areas that the Anabaptists and these outgroups, the brethren and so forth and so on, brought to bear that we benefit from even today. First one, the identity of the church. The reformers viewed the church in continuity with the Old Testament, and the Anabaptists, brethren and so forth, those out-church people, they saw the church as a brand new entity, so discontinuity with the Old Testament. Very important. Secondly, we see that in the area of membership, how do you become a member of the church? Well, first you've got to define the church. Now, the Anabaptists taught that in order to become a member of the church, universal, those people that have believed in God, and Christ throughout the ages, the way to become a member of the church is to repent and believe. And we said last week that you won't do that unless you're regenerate first because you're dead in your trespasses and sins. So you become a member of the church by repenting and believing through regeneration. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, I think we had it up on the slides here. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Not a drop of water there. Okay, we're not talking about baptism like we think of water baptism there. Baptism simply means baptizo. It's transliterated from the Greek baptizo. Baptizo means to be 
placed into. And the word actually comes, etymology of the word is a garment or a piece of cloth, linen if you would, would be placed into a vat of dye. Now they weren't really into tie dyeing, so it was completely submerged. Okay, that means immersion. It was completely immersed, placed into. That's where the word comes from. Mary once went to the Greek Orthodox Church, I think to get some food over on Summit one time, and she asked one of the priests there, um, do you believe in baptism by immersion? And he said, that's what baptism means. <laughs> you mean baptized by baptizing? You know, it's like, duh, yeah. So you're baptized all, baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slaves are free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. Romans 8, 9 says further, however, you who are in the flesh, who are not in the flesh, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, remember Pentecost, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to him. So this new entity, you come into this new entity, by becoming part of the body of Christ through regeneration and the Spirit of God baptizing you into the body of Christ. The Spirit of God taking you and placing you into the body of Christ. That's a spiritual thing that takes place and we emulate that or expose that by water baptism where we are immersed in the water to show what took place in our hearts. Is that okay? Kind of hit my third point, baptism. Baptism was preceded by faith. With the Anabaptists, baptism was preceded by faith. With the Reformers and with the Catholic Church, no way. They're infants. No way they could repent and believe. And it's one of the two ordinances left, not a sacrament. You don't gain anything from baptism. It's not salvific. You don't get saved by baptism. It doesn't bestow any grace. And many do this today and say, this is a picture of what took place in my heart when I believed. Now, the Anabaptists believe people are saved through the sacrament, excuse me, the Reformers believe that people are saved through the sacrament of baptism. And I, I don't even want to get into all the, the stuff that I taught on the sacraments and the Catholic Church and so forth, but if you go to a Roman Catholic funeral, you will hear the priest distinctly say, and this John who was saved through his baptism. You will hear it distinctly. That's why I don't attend Catholic masses any longer. I'll go to the wake, what they call the wake or the visitation before. But I just can't sit and listen to that uh, any longer. The Anabaptists taught the person first repented and believed in God. And baptism followed. So we got church identity, church membership, baptism. The fourth area is the Lord's table. Now, can I just say something to you? Um, in two weeks, we're going to have a church picnic and people are going to be baptized. Do you realize that people died by the thousands and thousands for baptism by immersion as an adult, as a believer? We're so glib about it. A lot of people just say, well, what's so important about baptism? Lots important about baptism. We stand on the shoulders of Thousands of martyrs. And so the Lord's table, another thing that many, many, many people died to protect the New Testament function of the Lord's table. Second ordinance, first one is baptism. Left to the church by Christ. Luther taught contrary to Catholic teaching of transubstantiation. I know I'm throwing stuff at you today, but that's, it's a history lesson. I told you that ahead of time. Transubstantiation is where the elements, the, the bread and the wine, literally become the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. In a spiritual way, the priest blesses them and they become the body of Jesus Christ and the blood. Luther taught Christ's body and blood were present in and under and around the elements. And that's called con. Uh, con substantiation. You can see where he kind of stepped away from away from Catholicism, kind of, right? 
but he's still pretty close. Zwingli came along and said, I'm Sola Scriptura, Martin. Sola Scriptura it says here that it's for a memorial. He got it right, and he held to it, and that's great. And that's one of the things that these, these Anabaptists heard this stuff and went, yay! Okay, now we just got to get him in with the baptism part. No way. Now we just got to get him in with the separation from the Catholic. No way. They were still with the state. But baptism. So that's the, the third way. The Lord's table is the fourth way, a memorial. But it meant so much more to Anabaptists who were severely persecuted because they saw it as a communal eating and drinking together with one regenerate, uh, with other regenerate believers, and it gave them strength and encouragement. Okay? It's kind of like the way we should be at communion. Gosh, I have so much to say. Okay, we're, we're reworking our worship service. We also will be re reworking the way we do communion a little bit. No, I'm not going to have you come up and file through and, you know, bless you when you take the Eucharist. So we're not, not doing that. But again, we're so glib, people. We are so glib with the way we do church. This isn't a fellowship group meeting. This is a worship service. We're worshiping the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And, and you know, we come and I don't, I don't know what we're thinking sometimes. Can I just say this? A lot of these Anabaptists, you know what they viewed the church to be? It was a group of regenerate believers, actual believers, that got together once a week to worship their Lord and Savior as they waited for his return. It was just a holding tank to worship God while they waited for him to come back because they were so certain he was going to come back. And soon. What if we knew he was coming back in two years? How would that affect our getting together? on Sunday. What if we knew he was coming back this fall? How would that affect the way we worship? But you see, it's imminent. We don't know when he, he could come back tonight. It should impact the way we worship. Okay, tangent, sorry. Fifth, church discipline, and I'll stop with this. So there's identity, membership, baptism, Lord's table, and discipleship. These are defining elements of a New Testament church. Okay? Luther and Zwingli initially upheld the idea of church discipline, but later abandoned it as their state churches began. And you'll, you'll never guess why. Luther said this, or excuse me, Zwingli said this, it would be adverse to the best interests of the church. And you think, well, why would it be adverse to practice church discipline? Well, he further clarified later, he said, because it would cost so many preachers. <laughs> Okay, he's being, he's being really, really open, isn't he? He's saying if we start practicing church discipline the way the scriptures teach it, sola scriptura, right? We'd lose a lot of the preachers. Why? Because they're not regenerate. They just found a good gig paid by the government, okay? And then, and then he just caps it off with this. Later on he stated, it would jeopardize the material prosperity of the city of St. Gall if we practice church discipline. We're going to lose all sorts of bucks. Okay? Wow. So we see why they kind of threw church discipline under the bus. Now Calvin, John Calvin, did practice church discipline. But you don't want to practice church discipline like John Calvin practiced it. Because he was part of a church, state church, he had the state civil authorities enforce the church discipline by coercion and excommunication at that time was practiced in Geneva, his little experiment, and those excommunicated weren't even allowed within the borders of the state. So, wow, that's a bit far, okay? The stepchildren persisted in their consistent practice of church discipline as a vital characteristic of a true Christian church. It shows purity. It protects the purity of the local church and the name of God. It provides protection. It protects others and shows them not to live in sin openly. And it brings restoration of the sinning brother. Three elements of church discipline that are so important. It is not 
it is not so much for uh, judgment or, or to be venial with someone. It, it's for restoration to see the person come to their senses if they're truly a believer. Jesus himself taught about it in Matthew 18, 15 by a four-step process. Go to the person privately if you see someone in sin. If he receives you, great. If not, go to them with two or three others. If he receives them, then great. If not, tell it to the entire church. And if he repents and straightens himself out or herself out, great. If not, excommunicate them from the church. Put them out of the church. Four restorative reasons. Four purity reasons. Okay. If you want to listen to a message on that, Chaz's message, The Biblical Way to Confront One Another in Sin, October 16th, 2016. You can get it on the web. Very clear, concise presentation of that. So why is it important and why have I taken the time to bring this kind of stuff to you? Okay? So let me give you a couple reasons and we'll close. To trace the history of the faithful. God is faithful and he has his faithful followers throughout the generations, even in the dark age, even in the time of the greatest apostasy. So don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Secondly, to show that as great as the reformers were, they were just men. They were just men, as we all are. Thirdly, every generation must experience the refinement of reformation. You can't just go back to 1517 and say, all done, it's good. It's not. And it's every generation. And there's been a lot of generations since 1517. Fourthly, the Reformation and the stepchildren of the Reformation show us the progressive sanctification. This, this, is a, this is a kind of pulling back the curtains and seeing God work. The progressive sanctification we often refer to in our own lives, right? We're growing from glory to glory, from day to day. We change, we transform as the Word of God gets a hold of us and we change things in our life to be more like Christ. That's progressive sanctification. I'm not as, as sinful as I was. I'm not doing the same sins as consistently as I was. It's getting less and less. I'll never reach perfection this side of heaven, but I'm growing. I'm growing, Okay? The thing is, the church is doing the same thing, people. The body of Jesus Christ, because we are the church. <laughs> so if we're progressively growing more and more into the image of Christ, then these little local assemblies that we're part of will also reflect more and more the body of Christ. And lastly, I want to applaud the stepchildren for the doctrine of the church that they so adamantly held on to. I am a churchman. I came out of the Catholic Church. I went to parochial school. And when I heard about the New Testament church and began to study the church, I was on a mountaintop, and I'm still on it. And that was over 40 years ago. Because it is so beautiful. The things that I looked for when I was a hippie, peace and love and unity with one another, it's all right here in the church, people. Okay, and we just need to protect the church and we need to extol God for giving us the church. And we need to recognize that it doesn't just stay pure by itself. We need to be careful. And yet, don't let us be as careful as Calvin was or some of these other guys, right? We don't want to go off to that extreme. So next week, we're going to look at the Puritans, the doctors of the soul, and the reason I did this offset like this is because the Anabaptists really helped us to understand the church, the local church, the manifestation of the body of Christ on earth now. And when we get to the Puritans, we start seeing a refinement of the individual life, what it's like to live like a believer on earth. And the Puritans have a lot of good stuff. They too needed refinement, right? Okay? Um, they get a lot of bad press because they were so doggone legalistic in some areas, but... Boy, they got a lot of good stuff out there. So we'll get into that next week. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you so much. And I pray, God, that you would just bless our time now. And bless our week, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' most precious name, amen.